it going everybody? Welcome to General Hospital MV, my GH after show. Before we get into it, I want to give a big shout out to those of you that watched my performance of I'm With You, as well as heard my song I'll Be Okay. It's really cool to me that most of you guys are subscribed for my GH content and that you guys took the time to listen and watch those things. It did my heart some good. I was in a really bad place the other day and seeing your comments actually just cheered me right up, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Alright, now let's get into it. So, I'm not thrilled to start off with this, but I feel like I should, even though I'm not a big fan of this couple. But Michael and Willow are officially a thing, and the reason why I'm bringing it up first is because they had the very first actual on-screen kiss since the pandemic started. Now, even though I am not a Milo fan, I have to admit that I was pretty excited to see an on-screen kiss again, and I was really looking forward to seeing more but during the rest of the week, the other couples that were on there still had those jarring off-screen kisses. Now, I can only really speculate here what's going on behind the scenes. I mean, it could be that some of the actors are vaccinated and some aren't, or that some people are comfortable doing it and some aren't. Regardless of the reasons, I kind of wish that they would have waited until all the couples did feel comfortable having those kind of scenes again, because it is really jarring going from seeing Michael and Willow making out and rolling over the bed and then you have another couple, who I'll talk about in a minute, having a kiss shown from only the torso, and then you see, like, sex happening, but it's just a hand in a steamy window of a car. I'll elaborate more on that later. But yeah, I'm happy for you Milo fans, I just wish that they waited until all the couples could also share kissing scenes again. But now, back to the actual story. So, Michael and Sasha broke up last week, and then Michael professed his love to Willow, and she revealed that she feels the same way and they kissed, and they made love. However, the problem is Willow didn't actually break up with Chase yet, so she does have to go over to him and bring him the bad news. The unfortunate thing is, Chase is the one that got the Russian roulette poison at the dinner. Whatever poison Peter gave Chase was a little bit of a slow burn. At first, Chase just thought that he had food poisoning. Finn took him home and offered to take care of him, but Chase just thought that he should just sleep it off, so his daddy brother left. He passes out on the couch and he ends up having a dream about Willow asking to move back in with him again. Poor, poor Chase. He's gonna be wrecked, man, as long as he survives this thing. Once he wakes up in a cold sweat, Brooklyn comes to the house to pay him a visit just to vent about what's going on in her life. While that's happening, Anna and Valentine decide to take matters into their own hands once again and try to kidnap Peter. Anna tased Peter and I was laughing so hard. I had to have repeated that scene like at least 50 times. Just the sound he makes with his mouth, he's like Aah! And then he just passes out, I was dying laughing. Ugh. They drag Peter down the basement and tie him up, and then of course he starts to say, you know, if you don't let me go, someone you love is going to die. Now before he gave that eerie message, Finn was actually at Anna's house for a bit, and she knows that he's fine, but just in case, she tracks him down again, and he's still fine, however, Finn mentions that Chase got food poisoning and she starts to put two and two together. When Anna gets back, Peter starts to gloat about how he saw Finn and his family at the restaurant and put the poison in one of their coffee cups. Of course, it was meant for Finn, but Chase got it instead. Now what was interesting about this scene is that Peter brings up that he was just taking a page from his father's book because his father actually poisoned Tiffany Hill, Sean Donnelly's wife, in the 90s and that's what he was inspired by. Now my initial reaction to Peter mentioning Sean and Tiffany was, oh my god, the tribute episode is coming up. We know that John Riley, who played Sean Donnelly, passed away a few months back, and that they planned on doing a tribute episode. It looks like they're about to write in his death. I swear to god, if they make Peter the one that kills Sean Donnelly, I... I don't even know what I will do. I will freak out. I will be so pissed. Peter needs to go. Now I got a couple of tidbits about that episode. Number one, Caitlin Riley, who is John Riley's daughter, is going to be playing the role of Sean and Tiffany's daughter, Anna. Funny enough, I'm actually a really big fan of Caitlyn, and I didn't know that she was actually John Riley's daughter. I have been watching her impersonation videos on YouTube and TikTok for like a year now. I also learned that Kimberly McCullough, aka Robin, is returning for Sean's funeral, so that's exciting news as well. Again, I don't know when the episode airs, but I do know that they shot it just two days ago, so it will be in the next couple of months for sure. Alright, now back to the story. I'm so annoyed with Anna and Val because these are two former WSB agents. Peter is literally admitting to everything and they don't have a single recording device anywhere. And what's worse is that these two doofuses agreed to let him go because he says that 
he will give Chase the antidote if they back off of him and Maxi. And guess what happened? He didn't give Chase the antidote. I feel damn bad for Chase because Willow does actually show up to the apartment to break up with him. She doesn't get it out because he collapses on the floor, she takes his temperature and is shocked and drags him to the hospital. Even on his hospital bed, Willow is actually trying to prepare to break up with him even though he's been poisoned. At first, Finn and the doctors were doing some tests on him, they couldn't find anything, but then all of a sudden he lost feeling in his hands and in his feet and then he started to feel burning on his inside. If that doesn't convince Willow to maybe wait until he's out of the hospital, then I don't know what will. Now as for Anna and Valentine, they have to go to Carly and tell her the bad news that they can't go after Peter because someone they love is in danger. And of course, Carly's number one priority is Jason and there's no telling what she'll actually do. Anna realizes that she has to change her tactics in order to bring Peter down and she sets her eyes on Cyrus. I don't really know what Anna has planned for Cyrus, but whatever it is, it's probably not gonna work because no one can take him down. Y'all can't even take the over theatrical Peter down. What makes you think you can take down a mob boss? Cyrus is walking around more confident than ever because he's got Nicholas looking for his mother now in exchange for keeping Alexis safe in prison. Suffice to say that Nicholas did actually find her and all he's got to do is say the word and they'll kidnap Florence. Ava is obviously not too happy with Nicholas being under Cyrus's thumb that way, but she agrees to stand by her man no matter what. And they too got a COVID kiss that was off screen and COVID sex that was off screen. They weren't the Titanic hand. I will tell you who that is in a bit. Patience, my children. As for Alexis, she may not be protected in time. There is a woman in the prison that is twice her size that is gunning for Alexis for no apparent reason. I really hope that this story doesn't just involve Alexis becoming someone's prison bitch. That's horrible. She hasn't even been in Pentonville for five minutes and she's already getting thrown against walls. It's awful. Okay, now we'll talk about the Titanic hand in a steamy window thing, all right? It's Sasha and Brando. Sasha visits Brando at his garage and he's fixing this really big Hummer and they have a good heart-to-heart -heart conversation. He actually admits that Dev wasn't his son and that he was in the country illegally and that Cyrus is blackmailing him and the Corinthos family with that information, which is why he has to keep working for Cyrus. He even shared that his mother was the one that actually gave Cyrus that information in the first place as well. Needless to say, things got a little bit steamy when they got closer. They ended up kissing, even though we only saw their torsos. And then we see a shot of the car and like clothes everywhere and a pan to the window and you see Sasha's hand just like press up against it. The window is steamy. I honestly thought that that scene was so much hotter than the actual love scene Willow and Michael got. I am a little bit biased, but come on. It's really true what they say. Sometimes when you leave enough to the imagination, it makes the scene a lot more intriguing. It gives us a sneak peek and leaves us wanting more. They don't just throw it at us. I like that. Apparently they spent the entire night there. I feel so bad for whoever owns that Hummer. That shit's nasty. Hot, but nasty. Now while some couples are flourishing, others that were already on life support are ending. Curtis and Jordan agree that they need to get a divorce because Curtis realizes that he will never come first to Jordan's job. I actually really enjoyed the scenes between Curtis and Jordan that was wonderfully acted, well scripted, and the dance at the end, it was just so sweet. But man, Jordan, you're losing a hot one. Did you see Curtis in that freaking undershirt? My God. You lost yourself a damn fine man and you only had yourself to blame. Side note, Portia and Taggart, who is played by the recast once again due to a false positive COVID test, Yikes. Uh, but yeah, they talk about their past and Taggart actually says that he knows that Portia had an affair back then and he also knows that it's Curtis. It wasn't hard for him to figure out. Obviously, it's kind of water under the bridge at this point. They haven't been a couple in a very long time. They have a daughter together as far as we know and they still seem to be good friends, so that's nice. My question to you is, do you guys want Portia and Curtis together and Jordan and Taggart together? I mean, on paper, they look like they would work really well as couples. I just don't know if I'm for it or against it. But if you are, let me know in the comments below. Since I mentioned a false positive COVID test, I should mention that Kelly, who plays Brit, had a false positive the other day, and as such, she can't work for 10 days. She did turn out to be negative. She took two tests after that, but with the uh, LA County laws, she wasn't allowed to go back regardless, so that's unfortunate. So probably in the next couple months, we're gonna see a temporary recast for Brit for a little bit, but I, I imagine not too long. Now let's talk about Brit's stories. Brit and Maxie are trying to put their heads together and figure out who they should give the baby to once they fake a stillbirth, and Maxie, She's just not too bright. She's like, I'll give it to Spinelli or I'll give it to Robin. Yes, 
the first two people that he will look for if he gets remotely suspicious is who you should give the baby to. Now that I'm panicking, obviously I'm pretty convinced that they're going to find out that Brooklyn is not actually pregnant and give uh, Maxie's baby to her to raise for a bit. Britt does vow that wherever that baby ends up, she will take that secret to her grave. And I'm like, please, please don't kill Brit, she is still having problems with her hand and I am terrifying because she doesn't seem to be getting help for it. I don't want Brit to die, certainly not before Peter. All right, but let's talk about Brooklyn again for a second. She and Dante shared scenes and Dante seemed happy to see her, but if I recall correctly, the last time they seen each other, she drugged him and tried to rape him. So I don't know why they're being all buddy buddy right now. I don't feel like he'd be too happy to see her. If y'all don't know that story, long story short, Carly hired Brooklyn to sleep with Dante so that he and Lulu would break up because she blamed Dante for Michael going to prison. Dante was such a good guy that he wouldn't do it willingly so she had to drug him. Thankfully Lulu walked in before she could actually have sex with Dante. After their talk, Ned shows up at the house vowing to win Olivia back with a big gesture and Dante and Brooklyn just look at him like he's cross-eyed because they're like, do you know Olivia at all? This isn't gonna work. Honestly, at this point, Robert and Olivia seem to get each other far more, but honestly, I would rather them just stay friends. I like their friendship. Boys and girls can be besties, it's fine. And we know that Holly is out there somewhere waiting in the winds for Robert to rescue her. All I'm saying is that I think Ned should come up with a better plan so that they can get back together and Robert can eventually go track down Holly. Still don't know when that is, but it's going to happen someday. I got my fingers crossed. Now those are all the major story points, unless you count the riveting adventures at the Tano Bar in the small town with Sonny and Nina. That storyline still hasn't really moved. Nina's still lying to Sonny about who he is and Sonny is trying to look into Elijah's past while Elijah is looking into Sonny's past. I honestly can't believe it's taking this long for Elijah to find anything about this man, even a picture. Like, it's Sonny Corinthos, big bad mob boss. This is why I have a problem with this story in the first place. I do kind of feel like they're slowly kind of moving towards Sonny and Nina being in a possible relationship a little bit because, of course, you have to have Jax pinned against Sonny all the time. I swear it has to be in their contract that they have to be rivals at all times. So we'll see how that goes. Other than that, Jax accidentally let it slip to Carly that Jocelyn was on the waitlist for a school in California because all Jocelyn mentioned to Carly is that she made it into PCU. She does also mention to Carly that her and Cameron are at odds right now and that's why she wants to get away and go to the university in California in the first place. Personally, I don't really care about this storyline much, at least not Jocelyn's point of view. I'd much rather see Cameron on screen going through that downward spiral. Like, I want to see him be a hot mess. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you thought of General Hospital this week in the comments below. And if you like this video, give it a big ol' thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to. And I will catch you guys next time. Peace out.